To look into this idea of using a wood platform, we need to look up the electrical parameters for wood. If you studied the electrical characteristics of wood over our frequency range, you would find that the relative permittivity of wood is on, on the order of 2, and the conductivity is on the order of 1 e to the minus 15 Siemens per meter. Wait a minute, we've seen where the permittivity comes into play. D is equal to epsilon E, but the conductivity, sigma, hasn't shown up in our equations so far. How can we account for the electrical conductivity? If we were to look around in the Ulubi book, or if we performed a Google search, we would find that sigma, the conductivity, shows up in Ampere's law. So let's dive into the details of Ampere's law and see if we can then determine whether wood would be a good candidate for the plat platform over the frequency range of 1 megahertz to 300 megahertz for our e E1 component of the EMP. So diving into Ampere's law, let's briefly introduce Han Hans Orsted. In 1820, he noticed a compass needle moves when it's in the vicinity of a live wire carrying electrical current. So here we have a wire going into the, or coming, the current is coming out of the screen. Here's our compass needle. Since compass needles react to magnetic fields, he determined that electrical currents induce circulating magnetic fields around them. In other words, he established a connection between electricity and magnetism. Mr. Orsted found that um, magnetic fields follow the right-hand rule. So if you place your thumb in the direction of the current, your fingers curl in the direction of the circulating magnetic fields. Based on measurement results, John Biot, Biot and Felix Savart developed an expression in 1820 that relates the magnetic field at any point in space, say here's our observation point, to the DC current DC current that is generating the magnetic field. So here we have a DC current flowing along this wire, and there's our observation point. This is known as the Biot-Savart law. You may have encountered this law in a previous physics class. In words, what the Biot-Savart law says is this. We can determine the magnetic field generated by a current carrying wire by first dividing the wire into infinitesimally short segments. Each one is uh, DL, DL in length. Then we treat the amount of current flowing along each DL wire segment as a point source. This means that the amplitude of the magnetic field generated by that point source spreads out equally over the surface area of a sphere as it move and we move further and further away in all directions from that point source. So the sphere is centered on the point source, which is each DL segment. This is why in the Biot Savart law equation, we divide by four pi r squared. That's the surface area of a sphere. And r is the distance from the wire segment to um, the observation point. The direction of the magnetic field that is generated at the observation point is given by the right-hand rule. So that's why in the numerator, we're doing a cross product of DL crossed with R. After we integrate all the point sources along the entire length of the wire in order to add up the contributions from all those infinitesimally short wire segments, we get the total H field. So here's our integral at any observation point of interest. For simplicity, let's first consider a long straight wire. The bits of art law can be simplified for this case, where the wire is straight and infinitely long. First, what I did here is I wrote the cross product, uh, DL crossed with R hat. I wrote that out here as, well, you can see the numerator here, DL amplitude R hat amplitude times sine theta. So let's solve this equation and see what we come up with for the magnetic field around the wire. First, whenever we solve a problem like this, we want to choose a coordinate system that makes the math easiest for us. 
Do you think we want to use a Cartesian, cylindrical, or a spherical coordinate system for this problem?